you see this uh, first demo screen, professional networking and research tools for scientists? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Well, let's <laughs> start again. Great ideas coming out, and 
the people who are behind these great ideas. One of the talks that I saw at the Bioengineering Symposium was by a fellow uh, named Andrew Hargo, and this is, I'm stealing this right from him. His point in showing this list of inventors and, and the supposed great ideas that they brought forth was the fact that this is not really true. And I'll use Thomas Edison as an example. Uh, Edison is credited with a lot of things. The Edison lab in New Jersey uh, went through a remarkable period. Uh, they had they were around for five years only, and in that time they had uh, over 600 patents from that one research lab. And they promised that they would have one small discovery every 10 days and one major invention or discovery every six months. And they actually delivered on that. His point in bringing up Edison was to contrast the amazing rate of invention and innovation with the idea that it is, in fact, Thomas Edison who did all of these things. And Edison was a fantastic inventor, but the research lab and his group of people that he assembled there is actually what made that possible. And so I think that in many of these cases, if you look and really dig into the story of these inventions, we'll find that the great man uh, behind the invention, there's usually a, either a great woman uh, behind that person who did not get any of the credit uh, or is getting credit very late in the story, or in fact, a team of people. This is the point of, of, of this whole idea. You see this in, in this analysis of the mean team size uh, found in science and engineering papers these days. This mean team size has grown uh, from about two people on a team uh, in the 1960s all the way up to approaching four and a half uh, people per paper uh, for the creation of one of these, these bits of scientific knowledge. Uh, the idea is so. My uh, my assertion to you is science is a is definitely a, a team sport, even more so than social science. And you can see just a little bit lower down that uh, that patents are also becoming more team oriented. It takes more people to do the same sorts of things, and I think that's that's related to this deepening uh, of knowledge and this amount of knowledge that needs to be understood and connected in order to make progress in the sciences today. So let's look at a, a scientist. I've heard scientists and good ones describe it in one way, which is as T-shaped. That's kind of interesting. This guy is somewhat T-shaped. So where are these T's? The one T, the long root of the person, is the depth of their knowledge, I would say but that's really uh, one of the primary features of conferences and going to universities and studying in a research lab. It's what a graduate degree in a lot of ways is all about, is improving your depth of knowledge in a field. The other piece is the breadth of your connections. Imagine stretching out your arms and being able to, kind of, how many people can you grab onto? How many people are within uh, your realm, and how many people are you connected to? Someone who is uh, a part of one of these research teams, someone who is connected and has a, a great depth of knowledge, I think will find themselves at, at the center often of research discoveries and innovation. So let's talk a little bit about what this means. And this is all related to social uh, social networking theory. When I say social networking theory, I'm not talking about Facebook or LinkedIn, but really what relationships be for the discovery of knowledge. People link to other people uh, via relationships. You can see here there is a, there's a social link that connects one person to another, and these links go out, and it's very possible that this person here in orange can get some information or become eventually connected to this indirect 
uh, this other person over here in blue, it's an indirect relationship. People often are called nodes. Uh, this, this comes a bit from graph theory. Uh, these gray bars are kind of called connections. Um, there are lots of different ways that these play out in the world. And you can take this very simple social graph, how many people uh, are you connected to, and look at different networks of people. So let's look at one of these networks. This is a visualization of a LinkedIn network. And you might, uh, just by way of orienting yourself, you can see again, here in this, uh, this upper orange cluster, there's a center point. There's someone there connected as a, that is a node. And they have connections that are branching off and, uh, and connecting them to other people. There's this bright yellow knot here in the center full of, uh, full of other nodes. And so these yellow, this, uh, this visualization is color coordinated. The yellow nodes and the yellow connections are people who are closely connected. You might think of these as people in your lab. These are your lab mates, people that you see on a regular basis. People who are further out from you who are not quite as well connected uh, are depicted in orange and are depicted here in red. And these are other groups, other groups that you wouldn't necessarily call close connections, people that you see uh, on a random basis or people also who are not in your field. These are not, they're not called close connections, they're distant connections, uh, random connections, lots of different terms can be used to, to describe them. The really interesting point, the reason I'm talking about networking for you, if it's not obvious, is that networks really are how ideas and information spread throughout the world. But let's be concrete about it for a moment. Here's, a, here's an interesting piece of statistic that uh, might motivate your ideas about networking a little bit. This is from a book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point. One of the things he talked about was uh, jobs. And I'm sure that eventually some of you will be interested in jobs. The key thing about jobs uh, and networks is that in a study of jobs obtained in the last 10 years, 65% of all jobs come from personal connections. They're not advertised. They are really uh, obtained and transferred between people based on these personal relationships, 65% of all jobs. And here's the interesting thing about that is that 16, there's 16.7% 16 of these jobs obtained through personal connections come from this close group here, the yellow uh, close connections, people that you see on a regular basis, your lab mates. It's actually a fairly small percentage, 16.7. 55% of jobs come from people out here in the orange and red, people that you don't see every day, people that are not part of your, your daily group, people that you may have met at a conference uh, or have seen a few times. That's more than half of those jobs are coming from people that you might not necessarily consider normally to be part of your network. 28%, oddly enough, of jobs come from rare connections. And you might imagine those as people that you met once, people that are not, uh, not even in your field, people that you have met at a conference uh, only one time or not really done anything with the relationship. But somehow, you're able to communicate with them and take advantage of the, the fact that they're looking to hire someone. So my point with, with this is that networks are important not just for idea sharing, but for really practical things like job sharing. The next idea that comes from that is, is really it's not the ideas that are the central point, but it's the network itself that's the innovation. 
Finding relevant information and connecting it in new ways requires connections to people. And I'm going to assert to you that the who of connections and relationship is as important as the what. Who knows this is as important a piece of information as what is what do I want to know? What is this thing that I should know? And sometimes an easier question to answer. Who knows this is something that's identifiable. You can find that person, you can ask them. Whereas a scientific problem that you're working on, something that you're dealing with in your research, you can't look that up in a book. You can't find out the what as easily. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of this. So let's actually talk about some of this networking and this node. I've got some tips for you. Um, my first tip is really to do something very uh, very vain, and that is to Google yourself. 65% uh, of people in the world actually Google themselves. It's sometimes called vanity Google. And the question is, can you be found? Whether you can be found on Google, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've done this. I'm kind of curious about finding out where I am. Um, a lot of this has to do with the uniqueness of your name, where you show up in the search results. Uh, some of it has to do with your geography, your occupation, your research area. Uh, when other people are trying to find you, if they have to put in a lot of extra information in order to come up with you, that's, that's actually a barrier to kind of ability. That's something that is possible to work on. The other thing that comes up often is the idea that there are similar people out there. Um, that here's a here's a somewhat interesting story. Um, there, when you Google Dirk Fabian, me, uh, there is in fact one other Dirk Fabian out there in the world that I found at least. And interestingly enough, in my graduate life, I speak interstellar dust. Also studies dust, and he studies dust in a laboratory. And it's the most bizarre thing in the world, but we honestly could theoretically share uh, or could have shared research publications if we were the same person, but we're not. So some of that stuff gets gets in the way of your personal findability. And I would suggest to you that my first tip, uh, one good way to improve your findability, improve being able to for other people to locate you is to establish a personal web page. Um, I'll show you a, a nice example. Uh, this is from the Daniel Rossini at Cornell. I know I've shown this before, but it's got some nice things here. It's um, so a quick link to his curriculum beta. He has a, a short, punchy paragraph about what he studies, what his interests are, his affiliations, what research group he works in, uh, some awards that he's won. Uh, this guy's a member of the Biomedical Engineering Society and uh, Society for Neuroscience, SPIE. It was his research interests and his affiliations. It's a nice, sharp, uh, personal web page that really improves his findability. There are other resources that you can use. Uh, I've actually worked on uh, a project at SPIE that if you have an account on our system, that you can establish something very much like this personal web page. Uh, we're calling it SPI Profiles. It's been around for uh, about a year now, and there are 2,000 people that have added their information to SPI Profiles. The nice thing about it is that every time you publish with us, this information gets automatically updated. So your list of SPI publications so is current, and it keeps track of other things like your involvement with society, any volunteer roles that you have. Basically, to get this working, all you need to do is log into your account on the website, go to the account management screen, and, and edit your profile. This piece of information gets repurposed in, in a bunch of ways. Uh, we have an application for the iPhone now that takes this information and combines it with our uh, conference programs, so it's easy to find who is giving the talk and where we're a little bit more about them. There are lots of ways you can improve your personal findability. I think having a personal web page is really a good one. Um, 
as a note, I, I just checked this link. I used to have a link to the manual proceeds page. It's one that I just showed you here. And unfortunately, Cornell University has uh, shut down these pages. So there's definitely some management that goes into it. But I think the rewards for having one of these things is, uh, is pretty, pretty high. So let's go on to the next tip, this is the business card swap. Um, I'm curious, and unfortunately I don't have a way of finding this out, but I'm curious how many of you have business cards. Now, I heard something this weekend which I, I thought was pretty funny, and this was, uh, the quote was, I'm an academic, I don't need business cards. But when I heard this, you know, I, I, I definitely I empathize with this statement, but what I heard when this was said was, I don't wish to remember you or be remembered after this meeting. Business cards are little paper reminders. I would even say that they're artifacts of, a, uh, of the business world from years past, but they are still incredibly useful things. They're a great way to have a little reminder of people's contact details, and a great way so that when you go back and if you're collecting business cards, when you get done with this conference, you can keep track of all the interesting people that you've met and all the things that you've promised to send that person or to piece of information to give them. All of that is, is just a handy tool. And there are lots of business card creation uh, pieces of software out there that you can take advantage of to get one of these things made. In the days of the internet nowadays, uh, business cards are, I would say, the reminder piece to get you to go and make these connections in a virtual setting. Um, there are lots of ways to do virtual connections as well, but I'm going to put that on hold for a moment and talk about just more of these face-to-face -face networking tips. I think it's good to have goals. And one of the suggestions I've heard for goals is to try to meet 100 new people uh, at every conference. That sounds absolutely insane, but it is a goal to reach for. And that's uh, it's a big number, but you'll be surprised how many people you actually get through. And not everyone is going to be the solid connection, that piece of information that you're looking for, but it's a, it's a great start. It's a good goal to have. Some additional skills making eye contact with the person that you're talking to, asking for introductions, and introducing others to, to your friends and to your connections. Being a connector in a professional setting is, is really a, a center for your own kind of, your own network. Be the, be the entrepreneur, be the, the captain of the ship that helps other people do their networking. And I guarantee that you will be remembered for that. Uh, more than just about anything else. This business card swap uh, is a great way to take notes on action items and to keep track of the, the follow up that usually used to come from conferences. Saying thank you for an introduction, asking a question, or making another introduction for someone are, are really good, good uses and good things that should get done after conferences. The next tip I have for you is something simple it's called the elevator talk. And this is, uh, I could spend an entire 20, 30 minute session just doing a little primer on the elevator talk. A lot of people have these ready to go, but this is a one minute short burst of information about your science. And the goal for this is really to get someone interested, to get them to ask the question, tell me more. It's something that you need to practice and not every, uh, not everyone is going to have a very easy elevator talk because the idea of that this is to not have a lot of jargon, not have a lot of exclusive science language that might eliminate someone uh, just based on them not knowing what acronyms you're using or what special principles you're talking about. Try to keep this one at a high school level when you're putting it together because you never know when you need to talk about your science in a simple and accessible way, and the people that you're going to be talking about your science to may not be people from your area, they may not even be scientists. And nonetheless, 
they might be people that you want to network with, people that you want to bring into your into your circle. So I'm just going to leave it at that as that one suggestion. I hope uh, at some point during this conference you might work on your elevator talk, try to get it down to a minute, and practice it with the other people. One of the best questions that you can finish up the conversation in the scientific setting with is this one. Who else should I talk to about this work? This answers the question, who, again, rather than what. But this is often a much easier question to ask and a much easier question to answer for other people. Who else knows about this? Who else is an expert? And who else uh, might be able to help me or put some uh, put some additional information into the system. There are lots of ways, as I uh, come back around to the, uh, the the social side of things, there are lots of ways to keep track of your who's. You'll collect a lot of who uh, information. And I would say that, uh, that LinkedIn, I've been using it a, a good bit for the last few months. We have, SPIE has a LinkedIn group that has 3,400 members of it now. 140 CEOs, about 100 presidents. Uh, there are job recruiters in the group. Lots of people in their ways. It's a way to connect up with these who, uh, people that you may have met in person at a conference, or in fact, even people that you just want to meet. There's, it's, a good, it's a good system for finding new people. And in fact, if you're, uh, if you're looking for new information, you can use this, you know, the search terms, use keywords, and get in there and find, uh, find additional folks. Facebook, Twitter, I, I've heard Twitter described as uh, uh, a network for people that you want to meet at some point. That's a good way for following trend and some news. So I'm sure you've probably played around with some of these, uh, some of these social networking things, and uh, just encourage you to look at them a little bit more. So I'm going to give you two tools uh, for research organization that I found recently that I think are pretty useful. One of them is from the AIP, and I'm hoping that you can see this. This is a, uh, a research network visualization tool called Unify. It's there at, the top, there at the top of the screen. And this is my Unify account. And basically, the idea of this is you can see your different connections, your different people that you've published research papers with, and then see who they, in fact, have published research with. And it's a nice visualization tool, and it keeps track of papers uh, pretty nicely. The second tool, which I'm, I'm pretty excited about, is something called Mendeley. Uh, if you're trying to organize your literature list, if you're trying to find different pieces of uh, information to add into your paper, if you're writing the introduction to a research paper. This is a really interesting tool to check out. Basically what it does is it takes those PDFs, all those different paper PDFs that you've downloaded, and it scrapes them for bibliographic information that you can add in to your, uh, to your systems. Uh, it's cool, and the thing that they've done nicely with it, I think, uh, that you might find is that there are social tools embedded in this. So you can share those papers, you can share that bibliographic information, and it's, it's good work, uh, or it's a good tool to use for collaborators. Okay, so those are the, those are the idea of people organization tools I wanted to talk about. As a tool, I would say a professional society, uh, I would classify a professional society as a network tool. Uh, so I'm going to fly quickly through this little piece here, but I do want to talk about SPIE and the idea of professional societies as networking tools. Hopefully, you will not always be graduate students at your current university. Your careers will advance. You move on in, uh, in both your interests and your abilities, and you want to keep connected with your colleagues. And I think that's one of the primary uh, benefits of professional society, professional society membership, is that you will see these people in your network at society events. And honestly, 
SKE, OSA, MRS, IEEE, BMES, these are all, the idea is the same among all. They have different features, they have different strengths and different weaknesses, but I would suggest to you that they are one of the, the best tools for career development uh, for students and mid, early and mid career professionals. You get everything from industry, uh, an industry view to research views, you can exercise your uh, your interest in education and outreach. You can be this be the speaker and have have this good experience uh, of reconnecting with this small world of research on a regular basis. SKA student chapters are just one way of doing this, uh, but it's a way that we've become fairly successful in the in the last few years. There are 4,300 SPI student members in the world, and about half of those are involved in the student chapter. Every year we do a, uh, a weekend long leadership workshop, and this brings together the, the goal of this workshop is really to bring representatives from all the different student chapters in the world together uh, for this one weekend in advance of the Office of Tonics Conference. And it's been growing this year, I believe, where we have 115 student chapter representatives. Uh, who are coming and usually they bring some of their friends and we might have 150 people at this leadership workshop. Um, it's a full weekend. We talk about everything from presentation and scientific, uh, scientific writing skills, how to work with journals, how to work with uh, contacts in industry. It's a good time and uh, if you're interested in that, please do get in touch with me uh, because I, I'd really like to uh, I like to see student chapters keep growing as they have been. There are conferences throughout the world. Uh, this is our little SPA conference calendar. All the ones in white are from North America. The conferences in red are in Asia, and the conferences in yellow are in Europe. We're just about to come up on the Tonics uh, conference, and fall is usually when uh, we do our conferences in Asia. Tonics Asia is coming up. All these other things are useful. You can see from the, the list of topics that they really do cover uh, lots of lots of different areas where photons are involved. There are tools that you can use to uh, do education outreach, and whether you're a student chapter or not. Laser timelines, education outreach poster, DVDs, uh, and these hit the target kits, which I will be sending to Dennis and we'll talk about uh, in a few more days. Uh, we're gonna move on. Uh, we'll do this hit the target laser challenge in a few days, as I mentioned, uh, but this is part of the grant, part of the, part of the grant, and it's support from SPIE and OSA uh, to have a, a kit that students can take out to high schools and middle schools where they want to teach younger students about autism and comics. Okay, so this is my last slide. What now? What's the, what are some of the next steps? I would encourage you to think long term and, and really use these tools to take charge of your career and take charge of building this network. I would say don't get to the end of this conference and not have made at least the entire conference full of new contacts and come up with these new ideas. It's great to have fun. This is a really important thing. Um, but building this network of contacts, I think, is, is really the, the valuable piece. And it's the piece that helps you assemble these new ideas and assemble these, uh, <clears throat> assemble these groups of people that can help take your ideas to the next step. So make your ideas accessible and findable by a wide audience. That means not just you, but your research. So find different ways to, uh, to share it and uh, put it out in the world. If you're at this conference, you're definitely here to develop your leadership skills and your communication skills. And that really does relate a lot to becoming a mentor, finding your peers and younger students that you can help and that you can share your expertise. I would say explore options in industry and government and use professional societies because they help influence the direction of your profession. So that's about it. Uh, well, thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to take any questions. Um, I think for this part, it would probably be good to switch back to Skype.
are there questions? Great. Well, thanks for the, thanks for your time.